Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another Dan Bigham interview. Uh, great to have you here, Dan. And uh, yeah, where are you in the world right now? Yeah, thanks for having me again. Uh, what is this, number 17 <laughs> on, the, on the channel? <laughs> uh, I am in Aransal in Andorra. So a bit of altitude in my new, I say, our new apartment. My name Joss is, although she hasn't made it here yet. She's uh, racing uh, the Valencia stage race, St. Marna Valenciana. A feminine, there's a lot of words in it. Yeah, she's away racing right now. I mean, huge year last year, huge year. Well, we just started the year mainly, but we can start so many different places right now. But I'm choosing the Ineos angle, Ineos Grandiers. You've kind of joined the super team in your screen days as well. I've seen someone said it was race engineer and also performance race engineer. What's your title and like, what do you actually do day to day? Um, I think I'm a performance engineer now. I think originally we're race engineer, but I mean, it's just a title at the end of the day. It doesn't really change what I do. Um, so there's, I guess, a lot of different things that I do and it all it all depends on yeah time of the year and what's going on and everything else but um pretty much anything that's kind of rider facing aero wheels tires gearing performance related on the energy outside kind of falls into my remit so I could be doing like rider position optimization could be doing like equipment testing tire pressure testing gearing optimization could be doing pacing strategies could be at the races actually being hands-on and trying to, to optimize performance in recons and actually in the race. Uh, could be uh, working on the, the simulation stuff behind the scenes. Could be doing my own equipment testing for the team, working with sponsors and partners on all the development of that. So it's it's pretty broad. Uh, it means, yeah, I'm pretty close to the coalface, as it were, with riders and coaches and being very hands-on, but then also behind the scenes as much as possible, working with uh, a lot of the, the really smart, nerdy people that we've got within the team. How, how much has it changed from like what you did? You used to do consultancy as well with Yombo Visma, for instance, and working in watch shop. So how much has it just basically, have you just transferred it all to Ineos? There's a lot of crossover, definitely. With Jumbo, um, it was definitely a lot more light touch. So I was involved um, in maybe a handful of projects over a few years, just trying to help and guide and advise, whereas this is quite literally all in. <laughs> so um, I'm entirely Ineos in every respect. The the equipment that I ride, um, obviously the work that I do, everything is all in your focus. So um, although I'm still a part of Watch Out, my work there is definitely uh, taking a, uh, a step back um, and kind of a bit more light to touch and overview. So the things I've learned there, obviously, I, I continue to, to use within within EOS. I think it's just that the level stepped up massively. So instead of over the past few years, I've gone from working with everybody at like uh, sort of uh, keen amateur level through to, yeah, obviously, Olympic medal and medalists, but like now we're at the level where we're trying to win the biggest races. There's obviously winning the Grand Tours, winning world championships. Um, hopefully, obviously, myself and with Filippo, the, the hour record as well. So there's kind of a lot of goals rather than most of our projects are very singular in that respect. So um, lots of different plates to spin and lots of different focuses uh, to kind of, yeah, try and optimize within. Have you felt like the, the equipment you're working with has stepped up a bit? And of course, Ineos. They have ties to the Mercedes F1 team. You have ties to the Mercedes F1 team. So is that something in the long term, potentially? Oh, that's a really cool connection. It's, it's mostly come from Ineos. That, well, it has come from Ineos, that connection. So Ineos now, or Ineos Sport, I think uh, it's six different teams with, I'm trying to remember all of them. There's obviously the F1 team, there's us, there's Ineos Britannia, the um, America's Cup sailing team, there's uh, the All Blacks, there's Nice Football Club, uh, Kipchoge, might be another one I'm forgetting about here. But basically, a lot of very, very good sports teams in very different arenas. And there's the idea being there's so much like cross pollination of ideas and knowledge um, and the application of that. So there's, I mean, there's a huge amount of crossover between cycling and Formula One. And that's obviously what my background is and how I came into the sport. So to kind of go back to the same people that I used to work with, okay, there's a lot of new faces and different faces, but also a lot of familiar ones as well. So that's part of the job I'm really looking forward to. Um, hopefully be down at the Brackley factory in the next few weeks and months. And yeah, just um, pick their brains early. And uh, I mean, there's already some projects going on between the two, but uh, they're such an advanced engineering, effectively a consultant 
consultancy in some respects. They, they have so much knowledge that they can apply um, and cycling's just decades behind Formula One. So it's, um, it's a bit of a dream. But then also it's, it's, um, it's quite a weird environment. It's something I've said previously, when you work in Formula One and grow up as an engineer in F1, you don't quite understand the uniqueness of the situation, the fact that unfortunately money, or fortunately in there, no, money is no object, time is all that matters. And if it costs 10 times as much to get something at the, produced in half the time, then that's totally reasonable. <laughs> that's totally expected. Uh, whereas in, in cycling, money is an object uh, and you have a finite resource. So it's, um, it's something not that I've struggled with. I've definitely come to terms with and definitely have a, a much greater understanding of, but it's um, a unique environment in that respect. And the engineers come from that direction with uh, these are the cool things you could do. And it's like, we could, but unfortunately that's really expensive and really niche. But um, hopefully, yeah, there's a lot of uh, practical ideas that we can definitely apply and, and use for, for good performance going forward. Last year, again, one of the other headlines you made, uh, one of the many, was the narrow handlebars you had when you were racing in Denmark. And uh, yeah, do you think, well, where do you see like the kind of the optimization in cycling um, going forward in the future? Well, tyres have been spoken about a lot recently as well. Yeah, tyres and aero. I mean, they're the two biggest ones, really. The two biggest um, parasitic drag losses. So it's an absolute no-brainer to focus there. I mean, the narrow bars, it's an interesting point now with, um, obviously, Froome and a few others have had their opinions on TT bikes and the safety of it. And people are like, oh, ban time trial bikes. And it's like, well, no, it's not. Time trial bikes aren't inherently the problem. Like, obviously, there are some factors that affect their stability and how they're designed and optimised. But like if, if we ban time trial bikes and go down road bikes, then it's not that suddenly like the playing field is leveled and everyone's competing on the same component tree. It's obviously not the case. It's just that all that R and D resource that would be involved in a time trial time trial bike optimization and be around road bike optimization. So yeah, I think if anything, it would probably make road racing speeds even quicker because then people go, well, if I can time trial on this super optimized road bike, then maybe you could road race on it, which is practically what I've been doing anyway for a few years. Like my road bike setup is not normal, never has been, um, and becomes more and more optimized around a certain way of racing. And that just suits my attributes and, and how I want to race. So yeah, it's, um, I think the sport is just coming to terms with physics and how they actually matter. Because <laughs> uh, it's long not been considered and yeah. Uh, the genies out of the bottle as it were uh but yeah anyways uh, moving on to um nationals last year so of course one of your targets as well this year in lincoln uh, you did yeah well you nearly won the thing one of your colleagues now is the british national champion but how was nationals for you it was one of your goals and uh yeah are you looking forward to is that kind of what you're going to be doing this year are you going to be more doing time trials yeah i'll do a handful of road races don't get me wrong like or just throw that in a bin and, and leave it. I, I do enjoy them, but my, my focus has always been TTs and that's what I really enjoy. So, um, yeah, I'll be doing nationals, hopefully Com Games, hopefully Euros, Worlds, um, a few others that I can throw in here and there. So um, that's definitely the, the big focus. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, making my, my competition quicker in, uh, in Ethan and even some of the other guys who, who might come along, whether like Garen comes along or... Um, obviously, some of the new kids with like Ben Tullet, Ben Turner, like they've got gas and they're aero. So, I mean, if if they all rocked up, then it'd, it'd be a, a hard battle for even the top five. Like they're really showing great potential. And I mean, I totally buy into making everybody in the team quicker. Like that is a massive motivator of mine, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, it's often been to my own detriment in who bought bike was making my own teammates faster, and yeah, they beat me, but. It's fun like to see your mates go quick and be a part of that process and kind of feel the same here. So yeah, it's gonna make my life hard. But I mean, if we all if we all get better, then it'd be pretty pretty damn awesome if uh, yeah, we turned up to nationals and did like a top five lockout or something. Maybe I'm dreaming, but yeah, it'd be pretty cool. What's your like what is your day-to-day? -day? Like, how do you space it in like being basically training for <clears throat> other goals? I wouldn't say the two words that we're gonna talk about later, but um yeah how do you kind of balance that with now being a race engineer i mean you've just got to be very picky with your time uh it's precious at the end of the day there's only a finite amount of it every single day so uh, i have 
fairly regimented training program and I'm definitely not the person out there doing sort of four, five, six hour rides daily. Like if I squeeze them in, it's on the weekends at a push if I'm not away at races. So um, yeah, it just means I train probably a little bit differently to, to most of the people, more sort of high zone to tempo work um, and try and squeeze that in pretty much in the morning and then spend the rest of my day doing work, whatever that might be, whether it's meetings, calls, testing. Um, I mean, that, that's just one of a base. If I'm out and about, then I could be a bit of a at a race, uh, a wind tunnel, wherever it might be, then yeah, things just uh, very fluid in that respect. So I could be anywhere and you just, like, I've always, always been in that kind of environment. You just get used to uh, training on the turbo, training when you get a spare hour, just doing what you can, best you can on that day. So it doesn't mean like I'm doing perfect sessions, but if it means that I've got one hour and those one hour that I'm tired and demotivated and it just means that I ride at zone two for an hour, then it's zone two for an hour and I'm just going to have to accept that that's all I had and that's the best I had on that day. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's not easy, but I wouldn't have it another way. I don't I don't want to be the rider who just trains and, and recovers and has that big race calm. It's not re- really why I came into the sport and... There are other people in, I mean, most people in the sport obviously have a great passion for all these different races and their ambitions and how they want to achieve it and how they want to help their teammates. And my kind of passion of helping my teammates involves me sitting behind a laptop or doing some testing or being a wind tunnel. And that's, that's my, my passion and why I want to be helping them. Um, and then, yeah, my own goals are a bit more um, limited and in a sort of more ad hoc basis rather than a week in, week out. Let's go and smash up some five day stage race, then go do some classics. Think I do grand tour, whatever. That's uh, it's not me, and it's not why I was in this. I uh, got into the sport. It was always the, the application of the, the engineering that really kept me in it and kept my interest. I mean, you still must have a pretty hectic calendar in terms of visiting airports and going here, there, and everywhere, akin to that of a pro cyclist, anyway. Yeah, you can't get away from that when you're in the sport. Uh, you've always got to be everywhere. And that's right, that's one of the reasons to move to Andorra. Okay, the, the nearest airport is not exactly just down the road. It's sort of Barcelona, unless you can look a flight out of uh, La Salle. But um, it just means that life is a lot easier post-Brexit and with all the, the COVID stuff of can, can we travel, can we not travel, that kind of stuff. It's a bit of a nightmare. So being here, being close to the riders, and the fact that they'll be traveling to these races as well. So if it means I can hop in with... A lift or a taxi or get on the same flight and it just makes general logistics not just for me but for the team as well a whole lot easier that we all sort of travel together and obviously then the advantage as well that half the team are within a half an hour bike ride of me so we can all meet up and if I want to be doing testing or just riding with them and seeing how they're doing then it's uh, it's easy to set up. So well you mentioned a few of your goals Com- Commonwealth Games the Nationals but I mean last year you also did I think the hour record if I recall no, I never did that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, of course, in Gretchen, absolutely incredible velodrome. And uh, yeah, I was just absolutely thankful for being part of that in a very small way. So uh, yeah, is that is that the hour record? Obviously, has been talked about so many times that that's kind of your goal now. You weren't that far away from the actual hour record, but it wasn't UCI official, whatever, like all this politics malarkey mm. that has to come in it. But um yeah, is that kind of the big goal for this year? Well, I guess if it was UCI official, then I wouldn't be a record holder. Unless they recognise sea level. And if people think 450 metres is sea level as well, that's <laughs> not um, Yeah, it definitely is a goal. Um, I'm, I'm definitely focusing towards it. and I've got a lot of thoughts around it. Although there are other things that I'm working on in the meantime. And for me, I think a lot of it's just going to come from physiology. I don't have to ignore, I probably can't make a massive leap forward in equipment aerodynamics drivetrain it's just um yeah I'm, I'm approaching probably the limit of me being optimal that's not to say there isn't improvements there I'm definitely hopeful that there will be um especially with all the the avenues that the team partners open up with um different well everything frames wheels tires skin suits helmets the lot well I'll end up with the same helmet <laughs> I was already riding cask but yeah, just um, another opportunity to kind of try and re-optimise and see if there's um, a few more gains to be had. But yeah, I think most of it's just going to come from me being a bit, <laughs> bit, bit of a better athlete. <laughs> At least that's what I'm, I'm trying to, to work towards. And just, that's, again, another reason for Andorra altitude that I know I'm a good responder to altitude. Um, I seem to, to perform well up here. Um, and just trying to get more altitude stimulus throughout the year is, is probably going to be quite a good thing for me as, a, as an athlete. Um, and maybe just as well being a bit more remote from 
everything else that goes on in the UK. So don't get distracted because it's quite easy for me to be, uh, oh, I'm a bit bored. I should go and do this. I'm going to do that. I'll go and see this person. I'm going to see that person and get excited with all these cool things that are going on. And um, maybe that detracts a little bit from my uh, from my pure focus. So I think being up here will have many benefits in that respect. Well, to quote your team, if you're looking for all the marginal gains, wouldn't one of the marginal gains be moving your hour record to Mexico? <laughs> yeah, it definitely would. Um, I kind of, I've mulled it over a lot and I don't, I think going to altitude, don't get me wrong, and like, I don't want to be held, held to this in the future. That I, might, I may go to altitude for an hour record at some point, but I don't think this one. I think with how close I am right now at sea level, sea level 400 metres, whatever, I call it sea level, then I think it'd be a nice challenge to try and bring the record down from altitude to sea level. Like, yeah, it's harder, definitely. Going to altitude is faster, especially if you do the preparation properly. But like, who wants the easy route, right? It's a fun challenge. <laughs> if it makes it uh, a cooler record to hold, even if I only hold it for a short time period, then um, I'm all in for that. And I can always go to altitude in the future. So, uh, yeah, I think right now, aiming for, for a sea level record. How do you feel doing the the hour record, the British hour record now, last year? Like, what was it like? Did you feel like you were, because we, we had, everyone was holding their breath when you were a few seconds down on the, the pace. What was it 20 seconds down nearly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Dan. I don't think I explained to you my pacing strategy. No, you died. didn't. No. So I was a bit <laughs> perplexed as well. I was that like, was this stupid. must be wrong. This They must have done something wrong with the, with the count but no <laughs> i'll send you a screenshot of my pacing plan so see so you can probably put it up in it yeah people can see but basically the strategy was to go out a lot slower than wiggins so it, wiggins pretty much flat split if anything actually went out a bit hot and slightly died off not much like a i think it was like 0.2k an hour slower second half in the first half or something like that whereas i was going to go out like really slow so average lap splits would have been 16 Five, I think it was, and I was going to go out at like 17 zero. So I was going to lose half a second every single lap and then just gradually pick it up. So that halfway I'd be at 16 fives, and then for the second half, hopefully by the end of 16 zeros. Um, I actually went out a little bit faster. I was on pace, my 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 pace, my strategy, um, to about 10, 15 minutes, and then started going picking up a bit prematurely, but I felt good. Uh, so actually my my target was to be 26 seconds down at halfway. And actually, I was only about 19 a bit. So I was six seconds ahead of where I should have been. So everyone's going mad, like, he's 20 seconds down. And Joss is like, no, 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 no. He's like six seconds ahead. <laughs> he's gone too far, too hard, too soon. Um, but yeah, I was in a good place that day and um, just picked up. And I started sitting 16 0, 16 ones, which is what, 56 and a half, 57 K an hour, I think. Uh, let's do the quick maths actually. I'll make get the value right. 900 divided by so yeah, 50, 56, sorry, 56.2k an hour. So it was about 56k an hour. Uh, and just sat there for 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And um, there was this period about well, for me, the hardest 10 minutes was um about half an hour to 40 minutes in. There's always like a block there where you start questioning yourself. And if you look at most hour records, that's where they fall apart, whether they they fell apart and just about dragged it in or fell apart and were kilometers away. They always seem to fall apart in that half an hour to 40 minute window. Um, and that's where I, when I've failed, and that's where they've always gone, gone south. And um, I went through that 10 minute block feeling like an absolute hero. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is good. <laughs> really good. And um, obviously you're, you're looking at your splits and, or hearing your splits 16-0, 16-1. And I'm knowing in my head, well, I'm taking four tenths a lap out of our Wiggins and, and the record and I mean it's, it's relatively simple maths then when you're like okay well I'm, I might be 12 seconds down it's like okay I'm 12 seconds down I'm taking four tenths a lap that basically means that in 30 laps time then I'm breaking even and 30 laps is is not all that far it's like 10 minutes so okay like you have a bit of variation in the laps and so much you maybe only take two tenths and so much to buy but um yeah chipped away and I think it was just after 45 minutes that I broke even and I was like I'm feeling good here like this is good. And that, that was kind of the enjoyable bit about 15 minutes ago. Like it was hard, don't get me wrong, but I had control, control of my line, control of the position, control of my breathing and control of the pace. And I was like, okay, now, now we, we just press on and see what happens. And um, it took about another 10 minutes until suddenly uh, I was like, okay, now I'm not in control. And it was that last five minutes that were, I mean, you call it hell. Like, the hours, they hurt. 
like it's going to the pain will always come and it's just kind of pushing back pain as much as is possible so just trying to not make mistakes early on because you pay for them at some point whether you hit pads have a bad line hold a bad position it's not that suddenly it goes oh you've done all that and it hurts now that just accumulates and accumulates and at some point it all it all piles up and yeah um physiology comes and bites you in the ass and yeah it took it to about the last five minutes for me to go okay and now i am all out whatever i've got is is what i've got my line is what my line is which wasn't great by that point and just doing all i can really to to get it all out and it didn't really drop off too much i think it was only that last few minutes that i dropped below wiggins pace so i was still putting time into him for, for a fair bit of that and um yeah generally just really really quite enjoyable it was really it, it went quite quickly uh for an hour um and then, yeah, I guess, guess when these things fall into place and you have a really good day and it all comes together, then it feels easy. It's kind of, it's painful, but like I think Brad described it as quite a sweet pain. Like it's enjoyable. You can push into it and you can suffer. And like they're the best days. And I was, I guess, quite lucky to have that kind of form on that day and it all really come together and yeah, make it quite a positive, enjoyable experience and not having to, to drag it in. So you said, well, in the interview, um, you said that it was about seven watts from you and Campanats. So you think living in Andorra, training regularly, three hours, whatever, uh, is that going to be the seven watts? Or are you going to drink like, a lot of beetroot juice? Uh, I'm not going to find much beetroot juice, not that much anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's many ways to skin a cat. And there's, I could could find five watts in physiology and a few more in, in if you've got the same results. So like a lot, a lot of people said uh, when they put that out that like, oh, why are you talking about watts? Why don't you just pedal harder? And it's like, well, watts work on both sides of the equation, guys. You can pedal harder by seven watts or I can reduce my drag by seven watts or do half or do one. Or do the other. It doesn't really matter. Like, anyway, um, that's me just moaning about people misunderstanding what I was trying to say. But yeah, effectively, one watt is 50 meters. So I need about seven to beat Camp Arts, assuming everything else stays equal. So um, yeah, I think physiology is just it's the most obvious route for me to, to make improvements where relative to other people of my kind of height, weight, size, watts per kilo are a really good measure and watts per kilo for an hour, I'm not really at the highest level, which shows us some, some headroom for improvement. Whereas I know my CDA relative to others that I've tested is, is definitely up there as probably one of the lowest really that you can get to. I know, I know a handful of people who are lower, but the amount of work taken to lower my CDA is probably a, a whole lot more than if I just spent that time training and that's not to say I won't work on my, my aerodynamics I definitely will like that's the enjoyment for me but I just have to be pragmatic and accept that if I want to break this record and unfortunately I'm going to have to do the thing that I don't want to do and ride my bike a bit more <laughs> rather than sit in front of spreadsheets all day. With the UCI regulations I was seeing when you were preparing Joss's bike how stringent they were how will that change from the setup you had in Gretchen to, well potentially Gretchen again but like how would it change for the official hour record of course like with the hour record we've had so many iterations with uh the Superman position of course um I think Chris Boardman and Graham O'Brien both had that and also well we had the Eddie Merckx where it was just literally I think a track bike he rode around Mexico so what what's kind of the constraint and I, I of course I understand as an engineer you love constraints so or trying to somehow modify the constraints. Way around them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. So what are the constraints? What are the, What's the difference between what you did beating Bradley Wiggins and then the official one? So from a positional perspective and equipment, nothing. So everything that I did for the British hour record is exactly as I would have to do for the world hour record. The only thing being is I'd need a spare bike, which I guess technically I had because Joss's bike was in track centre. But um, beyond that, everything about my position, my equipment, uh, was all as per a UCI World Hour record attempts um, because British cycling went under UCI record uh, UCI regulations. So I, my position and my equipment choice, etc., had to be commercially available, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I'd met all that, and I'd, I mean, even to the point that I'd, I had drug tests afterwards. It's just that I didn't have six months of being on the whereabouts program prior, um, which is pretty much. The only thing that I didn't really meet in the criteria when you think about it, but that's, yeah, probably, well, it's not the most expensive thing. There's other things that are costly around uh, timekeeping and live streaming and branding and oh, lo lots of things to tick off along the way that just take time and money and effort. So having somebody to help organise that is definitely um, definitely beneficial. So, yeah, the blood passport's not the only thing, but that's, that's the main one that's going to really change that um, 
yeah, I guess it's more of a stressful overhead, really, having to update a system to say where you are pretty much every single day, where you're sleeping, when they can come and test you, et cetera. And considering how erratic my life can be with traveling to races at short notice and things, then yeah, I'm just going to have to be, um, be hot on it. But it is possible, like Joss is on it, and to be honest, I barely particularly notice. It's only every so often you shout, oh, I need to change this and update it because you go to bed and then you realize that you flew back a day earlier or something like that. So you need to make sure that you update where your whereabouts are. So it's, yeah, it's going to be a bit of an overhead, but it's every athlete in the world does it. So I'm not going to sit here and moan and say it's, it's stressful because yeah, it's doable, it's achievable, it's manageable. And that's the idea behind the system. Like they don't want a huge overhead on you. They just want to be able to locate you every day, which is, is totally fair. So um, yeah, that's pretty much the only, only change. Um, obviously being in, in the Oscar ideas means there's a, world of opportunity that opens up with all their partners and quite looking forward to or already have um, relationships with them and uh, things in development so yeah there's um, potential there as well at the same time so uh, yeah there's not much else really to say that will be different for an hour record other than um, I've just got to go 360 well 367 meters further technically because you've got to beat it by at least a meter but yeah so have you thought about when you're going to do it in this very hectic time well race schedule that you can't escape uh it'll be sometime around sort of commonwealth games world championships kind of so quite similar to, to last year i think um just means that i can try and beat for sort of a handful of events rather than one event and then a bit of downtime and come back up again so i mean that's still quite a long period because com games is basically end of july early august and worlds is mid-september so it's kind of a six-week period there where i've got to be on a high but um i'm, I'm pretty confident i can do that so uh yeah, it does mean that nationals could be a bit, uh, probably not on the absolute peak because uh, that's sort of mid to late June uh, and I'm probably just going to be in a more of a training block then. But to be honest, I've never really struggled on sustaining good form as long as I'm not stupid. Um, just got to keep consistency and hopefully yeah, be in a good place for all of that. So yeah, sometime back end of the year, but right now I couldn't tell you a date. <laughs> so now asking Dan Bigham, the race engineer for Ineos Grenadiers, what is the maximum for the hour record? Because, of course, Philo Bugana has expressed interest as well. And presumably, mm. if, if that happens, you would be part of his hour record attempt as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm heavily involved in that project. Um, it's pretty awesome, to be honest. I'm quite excited by it. It's a fun thing to get your teeth stuck into. And um, just everything that I've learned over the past couple of years of preparation and just to kind of fast-track Filippo's learning as much as he's obviously, well, he's obviously been a world champion in the IP. Ashton stole it this year, <laughs> good on Ashton. Um, but uh, he's not an hour record specialist and he's not, yeah, he's obviously fantastic at road time trials and fantastic at IPs, but there are some sort of unique aspects that when you kind of bring it all together. So yeah, hopefully um, I have a big impact on that. Um, how far he can go, not my space to say. <laughs> um, I, I mean, hopefully something pretty awesome uh, beyond that i uh, i could not comment no it was just because um when bradley wiggins did his hour record everyone thought that was the limit and then suddenly the limit got pushed up further and then there was talks about is 60 kilometers possible do you think 60 kilometers is possible i'm not going to sit here and say no it's not possible because <laughs> i don't want to be like everyone before me oh this is the limit well it's never the limit because it's the best that you can do in that moment but you can still finish and go oh I didn't quite do that perfectly and that wasn't quite right and this could be slightly better and I think it'll be the same like when I cross the line I'll still have reservations around was everything quite as good as it could have been you obviously try and do your best but it's never ever ever going to be perfect um and it'd be the same with Felipe it'd be the same with a lot of the people who have a go but uh whether 60k is breakable I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong, it's pretty hard. That's, that's a lot of what's <laughs> a very, very low CDA, but it's not impossible. Nothing's impossible in that respect. I mean, like, look at the, the Fed recumbent hour record is like 95 or 98 kilometers or something. And that's like, no, no disrespect to them, but they're not world-class cyclists. They are mostly sort of middle-aged men, sort of in their 30s, maybe into their 40s. And they're just incredibly good at optimizing fed recumbent aerodynamics. And who's to say we don't have a similar breakthrough in aerodynamics of cycling uh, in a traditional UCI position that suddenly makes a quantum leap forward in performance? Don't think it's going to happen, but you never know. Um, and then, yes, yeah, suddenly instead of you going, is 60 possible? You'd be asking me, is 100 possible? And then, 
obviously, like, where do you draw the line? And it, it all revolves really around regulations and where the UCI draw their line, because at the end of the day, there's regulatory boxes uh, and rules, and we're abiding by them. And if they change or loosen or some great technology suddenly becomes opens up a world of opportunity that we'd never even considered remain possible, then suddenly, yeah, 60 could become a walk in the park. <laughs> you could be could be uh, miles ahead. But yeah, that's um, me just trying to caveat the whole thing of <laughs> maybe 60 years doable. But I think under current rules, current positions, current riders, then um, I don't think it is. We won't include that part when we take it out of context in five years' time. <laughs> Uh, would you ever consider doing the Eddie Merckx record just to see how close you were to Eddie Merckx in Mexico? Yeah, Mexico? I, I got a lot quite quite far down <laughs> on bike design actually with that. Um, there's a, a company in the UK called Sturdy Cycles who uh, I followed for years actually. I messaged him when I was back at uni trying to blag um, one of his really cool custom TT bikes out of him. And at the time I was, I was still relatively a nobody, but um, I still, I speak to him quite a bit and he's a really, really cool guy. He does uh, custom titanium bikes. So he has titanium tubing and then synthes all the, the lugs. So like the headset, uh, sorry, the, the head tube, uh, the seat cluster, bottom bracket, all of that. So it all can be entirely bespoke and it's, it's such like a cool thing. Um, which basically could fit then within the Merck's rules. So you'd have a road bike position and you could set everything as, as you want to. Um, I think with how everything's moved forward over the past, has it been 30 years, something like that? <laughs> then um, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I've run the numbers and I think it's doable, um, but the biggest bottleneck, or no, the biggest straight stop is that the UCI now aren't recognising attempts on his record. So I'd ask them and they said, just straight up, sorry, we don't. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> I'm like, oh, please. So if, if I do it, it'd be just another unofficial attempt, which is great <laughs> in the record book. But then I guess if you do it and that you're open enough about everything that you are doing, then okay, you don't have the scrutiny of the UCI, but you could probably have somebody who has the, I guess, the standing within the sport to say, no, this this is legit and therefore it's a, a fair record. But I don't know, maybe give it a go in a few years. It's, it's definitely not on the, not in the bin. It's, it's just on the back burner and, yeah, we can have a go. Yeah, and uh, just finishing, well, a connection with Philippe Ugana. I still haven't forgiven him for what he did in Tokyo. Uh, you worked with the Danish national team, and uh, yeah, he <laughs> robbed a medal from us. But uh, yeah, <laughs> how was that experience just working with the Danish National Federation and then seeing the project through, kind of? I'm a lot of laughs and jokes with... Well, definitely uh, Filippo's coach Dario about this. <laughs> and obviously he was poking fun at the fact that they uh, they robbed it from us in that last half lap. But I mean, kudos to him. At the end of the day, it's fast to see him over the line. And yeah, fortunately, it's the days we were in that day. So, um, I mean, that day was pretty heartbreak. Those 24 hours, 48 hours, yeah, not fun. But um, I mean, they don't, I, I have really fond memories of those two years. It was two years, yeah. You know, enough of uh, with Denmark, it went from kind of the final few races of who bike all the way through to the Olympics, and just such a great opportunity, and just a really open, progressive team with just good scientific rigor, and just got a lot of time for that. It was just a really enjoyable experience, full stop. Just um, so many positives came out of it, obviously, and just those kind of opportunities yeah, don't come along very often. You just kind of have to grab them, go with it, and, and see where it takes you, and kind of throw everything behind it. and I did. I put, I put a lot of, I guess, my life into that project. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay, you obviously, you always want more and you don't win and you always question yourself. But um, I think I'm pretty happy with the with what what the result was and, and how it all went. And yeah, I think a lot of the guys off that have gone on to, to other cool things with, with World Tour teams. And it'd be interesting to see how it all pans out in Paris. I'll, I'll be watching from slightly further afield, although obviously I have a bit of input with... Um, with some of the guys in, in Ineos with Ethan Hayter and even people like Magna Sheffield, obviously, with, with America. And, um, you've got, well, Ashton for a start and a few other guys, John Croom. And yeah, they've, they've got potential to, to put Team Pursuit team together. So yeah, I think through Ineos, there'll be um, some involvement with the Team Pursuit stuff as well, albeit from slightly further afield. Well, yeah, that's basically the end of my questions. But before you go, I have to mention this book as well. Start at the end. <laughs> 
uh, there we go. <laughs> um, of course, make sure to check that out. I think it's still available at the watch shop. I'll include the link down below. And uh, yeah, we have a new cover actually just launching in a few weeks' time. Uh, so the paperback's about to come out, which is a little bit cheaper, it's about six pounds cheaper. Uh, and it has a cool new design on the cover. Um, so yeah, check that out. It'll be launching in a few weeks. Um, but if anybody wants to sign a copy, head on to the watch shop website. And uh, yeah, when I'm back in the UK, I'll get scribbling real quick. <laughs> yeah, thanks again, Dan. And uh, yeah, this isn't an unofficial record. You are the most, uh, well, most guest here. So uh, thanks for coming Literally back. Literally the most guested guest. <laughs> most uh, visited. What am I trying to say? English. <laughs> But yeah, thanks for uh, uh, being no, here. Thanks for having me, dude. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. uh, it's always good to chat. Well, see you again soon, I hope.